Well, hello again. After a bit of a break over the spring and summer, I'm back with the magical world of G. Michael Vesey podcast series. And we're in our third series already. Can you believe it? It's going to be a a really good series. I've already got three interviews in the can. And today we're going to start with Thomas Sheridan. Thomas is an author, artist and filmmaker from Dublin who came to international recognition in 2011 with the book Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. In recent times, his work has been featured in some of the world's largest media outlets as the interest in his work into serial killers, occult history and mind-controlled cults continues to grow. And I got started with Thomas by asking him what got him interested in all this stuff in the first place. I honestly don't know. Uh, well, I, I suppose school in the 70s when I was a kid, about nine, paperback books on magic and witchcraft were everywhere. They were very common. There was and all of these fabulous covers. And they had pictures of like witches in, in yeah. a circle of candles. And they were kind of half, they, they, you, you couldn't tell if they were fiction or actual books on witchcraft because they looked the same kind of cover designers that both. You'd have like a, a, a half naked, like a hot girl in a circle with candles holding a skull. And there's a sex witchcraft. Or, and I think I probably found one of them belonging to a, an uncle or a friend and read into it and said, oh, there's, there's a real, this is real, this is a real book, book of magic. And then just amazingly, when I was about 10, I got a copy of, I found it in Easton's bookstore in Dublin, David Conway's Magic of Primer. In the mm-hmm. original cover with, with the sort of like edgy black uh, and white pentagram. Yeah. And I was, and I, re- and I was just Mandrake Roots, everything it was me and a friend of mine, Tommy Farrell. We absolutely devoured the book because we thought it was like, well, here's comic books come to life. Here's horror films come to life. Here's things we can do. And there was a kid in school uh, and he was really badly bullying me, beating me up every day and everything. And I created a talisman for a protection based on what Conway had put in the book. Next day, he wasn't in school. Next day after that, he wasn't in school. He had broken both his legs or something, falling <laughs> off a bike or something. And But to be honest with you, that frightened me because... Yeah, with me too. <laughs> it frightened me. And I put it away for years. And then, I don't know when I was about... I don't know. Then I went through all the whole thing of like low craft and a sweepy and all that stuff, which is kind of like still having your foot in the water when you think about it. Yeah. You know, still having your feet toes in the water, but not like subconsciously. And then I started to really get back into it when I was finishing secondary school. And I picked up the Dennis the David Conway book again. And then I discovered the uh, it was it's still fantastic, the the Colin Wilson spoof of the Necronomicon the book of dead names and I found that in a secondhand bookshop in Dublin and I thought that was it was kind of like a chaos kind yeah. of book working it's a but I never ever thought that you could have this this kind of world where uh, fiction I was really discovering chaos but I hadn't read Lieber Null or anything by this stage I didn't know anything about it uh, it just uh, yes magic could be incorporated into everything one night I'm under my under my covers in bed about 17 and I'm listening to an earpiece in the radio with old Phillips, an old Phillips transistor radio took a nine volt battery. He had this white earpiece. Do you remember them? Yeah. And I used to put it in my ear. I used to be, and like, you know, I used to tune around the, 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 lo, the long wave bands all around Europe to see very exotic, you know, to me, it was very exotic. There was a whole world out there, you know, like uh, radio looks beyond radio looks, but barely and everything coming out yeah. of foreign languages. And I'm sitting on the there in the dark, in the light with a little flashlight under the covers reading i think it was like the dunwich horror or something but about the 10th time and suddenly i hear this noise coming in and i hear i hear rhode island's number one pontiac dealer route blah 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 providence rhode island somehow a signal had walked to the it does happen it can be blown by the wind or by solar storms a signal from providence rhode island where hp lovecraft is from at that moment, it was blown across the Atlantic and landed in my earpiece. I didn't even know what a Buick was. 
I didn't, you know what I mean? But it was just, I, when I heard Providence, Rhode Island, that was enough for me. I had decided there, I, I had brought that signal in there somehow. And then ever since then, it's been, it's been like that. It's all this, this, the quest for strangeness, I put it out to that point. Did you, did you ever associate with any <clears throat> schools or, or um, you know, have you been sort of a solo guy or what's the way that you went? Very superficially and phony, you know, like I'd meet a girl I had a crush on and she was in a Wiccan group or something like that, but it wasn't serious. It was more like, you know, socializing and that kind of, yeah. I wasn't being, I wasn't being a fake or anything like that. I was socializing, you know, never really I think the, my first introduction to that in a formal ceremonial sense was Wicca and I hated it. I didn't like it at all. I didn't, I thought it was just a, pe- a place, a pickup joint, the one that I was involved in anyway. And then, um, no, I tell you what, it was always, it was always an individual who inspired me. When I moved to New York, there'd be a person who lived in a studio apartment in lower Manhattan who was really into something. They'd be going to like the alchemist head or the, the, the magical child bookshop in Chelsea. And I found those kinds of people. I, I had mentors, or should I say people right. inspired muses more than the actual groups. I did think about joining the Golden Dawn in Dublin at one point, but I t- someone told me it was very difficult, very arduous, and it was uh, lots of dress up. And like I had a friend there, and she said one night she 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 found she wanted to learn magic, she wanted to learn like basically the secrets of the universe. She said had enough when she found herself dressed like Cleopatra one night and decided she, she went down Red Lieber Null or something the next day. So, you know, it never appealed to me. Being from your, you know, Ireland and being of our sort of generation, did you have any pushback from the community or your family being probably rather strongly Catholic? No, not at all. My parents were not religious at, at all. Well, I grew up in I grew up in a slum on the north side of Dublin, Ballymun, which is like was uh-huh. a notorious gap of a high rise flat. So there was no, it wasn't traditional Irish like country town, fair maids dancing at the crossroads and you know Collians doing Irish dance. And there was none of that stuff. It was like you know gangs and the IRA and street fights and drug right. dealers and stuff. Like that. But my parents never pushed that on me. They were they were I was you know I did I made my first holy communion and all that stuff, but that was just to go through the motions. Um, my father even told me when I was a, like a really young kid, he says, don't trust those, those uh, Catholic priests, half of them are kiddie fiddlers. So, I mean, I was lucky I had that, you know, yeah. so I never had any issue with that. On, on the greater level, no, nothing at all. I mean, again, I tended to like, I kept it to myself. I didn't make a big deal of it. And I kind of like, you know, my friends were all punks and metalheads and goths and stuff like that. So, it would, you know, I never, I didn't have a normal life that way, you know. I remember when when my ex-wife and I split up, I had been quite actively involved in a in a, a magic school in the UK, uh, Servants of the Light, you may have heard of it, Dolores Ashcroft Nowicki. And um, I had a black robe, you know, for ritual work. And I didn't take it with me, but when I returned to pick up my stuff, she'd burned it ceremoniously on the backyard because as a good Catholic, she felt that this was responsible for everything. Well... I have encountered that thing a few times. Uh, it's a very interesting process. I have known people who their, you know, their boyfriend left them suddenly, or their girlfriend left them, or their husband left them. And it's interesting. The first thing they do is they look for the tarot deck, or they look for any kind of thing that could have been in, in, in their in their grief, should we say, in their pain, in the, the need for rationalization. Yeah. They look things like that it's an interesting response i find and uh it, it's it's a sobering one too because you realize how witch hunts and all these things begin absolutely but yeah I've, I, you, that's that's not the first time i've heard that even like i know women who have destroyed their own tarot decks saying this thing brought me terrible luck that's why my boyfriend left me In, yeah. I, I thought that was response very very interesting it seems to me that a lot of where you came from, from a, at least a publication perspective, was more a, a sort of discussion of, of psych, psychological states of people. Yeah. Um, how, how did that happen? I know my life is like something from, it's so strange. I studied electronic engineering and ended up working as a consultant and a communications consultant in Wall Street. How that happened was just bizarre. It was, uh, I basically... 
hated uni hated college in Ireland. It was a I, like I said, I, I was actually subject to quite a lot of classism by like you know upper middle class students and stuff like that. Hated the college, hated the lectures, hated the student union especially. Couldn't wait to get out. Left after year, went to New York with a guitar, wanted to play music, ended up in a band, had a fantastic time, studied graphic design. And just amazingly, I went to an agency for my first job. And they said to me, like, what did you do before this? I said, well, I was in the sort of like a, I, I worked in, as a house painter, painting houses. And I was also in the underground art scene in the Lower East Side. And they said, oh, really? And they went like this, oh, really? There's actually a demand for people like you. And I said, what do you mean? Well, they're looking for, down on Wall Street, they're looking for people who can think off base, who think differently. Yeah. And what? So next thing I know, I'm in, the first bank I'm in is JP Morgan. And eventually I work myself up into the communications department of uh, in the International Banking Division of Goldman Sachs. And how it happened was they, <laughs> they they're no, these people are, are tremendously brilliant people in mathematics and all this kind of thing. They got the left brain thing. The terrible language. And they're terrible with like, they're, they're very poor, even though they're highly educated and go to places like Harvard and other Ivy League schools. They're very, what's the word? They're not, they're not erudite or anything like this. So they, they have difficulty conveying complex yeah. financial information to the average person. A lot of stuff that would have been done would be like, you'd have to write a document to uh, you know, a retired lady in Iowa has to see our pension fund is doing and why we sold the company or bought the company, this kind of thing. And that was my job basically. And uh that's how I ended up there. And while I was in Goldman Sachs, I have to say 90% of the people were beautiful people. And also while I was in City Corp and JP Morgan as well. But there was a certain level of management that had these bizarre individuals. And they were cold, ruthless, very glib, very superficial, very, very plastic, uh, but also kind of nasty in their own kind of way and ruthless. I saw them do things like one day, one guy I worked with had a baby shower for his new baby that his wife had. And the same guy threw the baby shower, fired him the next day, this kind of thing. And I was reading books on serial killers at the time. Again, this came, came out of a magic thing because I was living up in Von Cortland Park in the Bronx and I took an interest in the process church of the final judgment. And, I, and, and Maury Terry's contention that they were probably related to the Son of Sam cult and this, because I was always kind of bit, like, again, feet, toes always in the water one way or another, okay? Yeah. So I was exploring these, like, <laughs> dangerous parks in the Bronx and uh, looking for, uh, and finding these ritual sites and just out of interest, you know? And, but I, then that led to books on serial killers, okay? And I'm reading these profiles of serial killers, Ted Bundy, and I'm looking at the guy who's the manager of the office. And I'm going through the traits and the behavior of Ted, Ted Bundy or someone else. And I'm looking at the guy I work with. And it suddenly it dawned on me that these were the same people. The only thing is they kill using big business rather than killing you with an axe or a strangling or something like that. And then a few years after that, uh, Robert Hare, this psychologist, psychiatrist, the clinical psychiatrist and a professor in Vancouver, I think it is, British Columbia, wrote a book called Without Conscience mm -hmm. about these predatory interspecies predators about uh, socialized psychopaths who are just as ruthless as any Ted Bundy or Fred West or Ian Brady, but they don't actually kill because they don't want to go to prison. So they do it through more vicious and in many ways they're worse because at least Ted Bundy's honest, he kills you, he killed you. This, these guys do it in true gaslighting, bullying. I saw tremendous bullying in the workplace by these individuals. And that's how that, I took an interest in that. So I was came back to Ireland and I'd, I'd lost my job and a few things went crap and I had money problems. So just, I started making videos on like what I've learned about these guys and the psychopathy and what happened. And then a publisher asked me to write a book about it. And so I wrote a book called Puzzling People, but yeah. I still had it, if you read the book, there's still a lot of esoteric stuff in that as well. I talk about the allegories of Lucifer, things like the, 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 the possibility of demon possession and the jinn and other, other you know, families work in the UAE and so on who boast about the cruelty and stuff like this and being possessed by jinns. So I never, ever, ever, even whatever subject I covered, I'd always had my foot in this, my toes in those, that water. Uh, well, my, my background is a little similar. I started off as a geologist, but ended up as a VP marketing for an American software company. That was on commodities trading. So I wound up doing hedge funds and stuff in Wall Street. And I've met all of this. I recognize the people you're talking about very, very much. Uh, and I also 
recognize another class of human being, which is what I call the empty suit, the useful empty suit. And they're usually used by these same people. So they're the, they're the, the guy that is CEO of multiple failed companies, usually put there because he golfs with the Goldman Sachs guys or something. Yeah. There's also another kind too. There's fellows like me, they find very useful and entertaining. I found that I was being used by them that way, like uh, because I was always having like I was a good social kind of connection for them because I was always cracking jokes and having a laugh, that kind of thing. Yeah. And they need the kinds of so I, I guess I was kind of used as well. Like, the, you know, I, I can remember I'll never and you remember the empty suits. It's absolutely the, 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 va the voided vacuum, the vacuum with a P with a master's degree kind of thing. I know yeah. that's that. Yeah. Uh, I can remember this one guy called Frank when I worked out, I'm not going to name the place. And uh, he decided on Labor Day weekend to terrorize them all before they went home to make try to destroy their weekend. And I, I saw it from my own eyes. He deliberately made a problem that didn't exist and had them all terrified that they were going to be kept in the office all Labor Day weekend. And uh, after he was screaming on the phone uh, like a madman, like a, like a possessed demon or something. And these poor people are begging for their jobs. He comes out of the office and I'm actually shaking, thinking he's going to start on me next. And he comes over to me and he goes down and he goes, have a great weekend, big guy. It was just switched from one, one, from a predator state to yeah. have a state like that, you know, very, very disturbing. How come this sort of personality disorder seems to have spread more broadly because, um, I guess I, I, as a geologist, I was always interested in the climate change um, uh, narrative. And as you know, as a scientist, I fought against that narrative for 35 years. Um, and, and I know people who just spout the, the nonsense. And if they actually stood back and thought critically about what they were saying and matched it against their observations in a scientific manner, they'd realize it's nonsense. And now we have the same thing with, you know, the, uh, the, the, the virus and all this stuff. And, and you know, you, you just meet these people that just stand there and they, they with, with hatred and, and anger, spout this narrative. How do you explain that? Is it because I, I also have written a few blog articles about, you know, the British government's campaign. Imagine you have it. I mean, to me, that's black. That's black magic. Um, they're telling you to visualize and imagine having a virus, being sick. <laughs> well, it's been black magic from the start. Like we get fuzzy images of people being zipped up in bags in Wuhan and they don't really give you the context. They don't tell you how true this is. It could be anything. Lines of trucks parked mysteriously at night on streets in Milan, when you're supposed to put into your mind, oh, they're going to pick up the bodies and all this stuff. That's all, you know, these people know what they're doing. They obviously have an understanding of the craft too. And, you know, beyond the Bernays level, they understand that there's an actual way you get to this, the dark subconscious mind of people and weaponize it. I mean, the climate change thing, the classic symbols of the, the polar bear on a little piece of ice as if the, the fucker can't swim, you know, this kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Oh, picture and going, oh, look, the polar bear is about to drown because the Arctic, the Arctic is gone. And I'm like, I know people who are educated people who see that picture and they have a tear in their eye. And I go, you do understand when you go to the zoo and you see the polar bear compound, there's a big pool of water for them to swim in. You do understand that. <laughs> and it's like they never, it's all, it's, well, what we have today is almost like a weaponization of emotions. It's very interesting. It's, it's like superficial platitudes have been weaponized to a form of black magic. Like, yeah. uh, you know, I saw, you know, when Greta Thunberg came out spewing a load of nonsense, some UK journalist was on Irish radio uh, saying, this, this kid can't be going around determining countries, you know, power and uh, environmental policy. And they had this like politician from Sinn Féin here in Ireland going, how dare you attack a little girl? Yes. You know, yeah. uh, this kind of, and this is a, this constant appeal to virtue and to uh, platitudes and the superficial, that itself has become a, a kind of a black magic in, in many ways. They've become very good at that. Schmaltz, you know, years of schmaltz on the television. Yeah. The uh, relief, the red nose. Going right back to baby Live Aid, you know, if you dare question, if you, if you dare find anything wrong with this, or in, even remotely cynical for the right reasons, you're somehow a bad man. And this kind of, just kind of like uh, 
superficial altruism if you become a kind of a, a, a moralistic religion you know but i think these things also go in secular events yeah. i think we have if you if you look at what's going on now with the rona and the whole this whole nonsense and that the lack of actual critical thinking it's very similar to the crusades when you know entire towns in the south of france you know packed up their bags and followed some duke to their doom to try and liberate the the middle east from the heathens and anyone who disagreed was born as a witch and you know you had the you know the inquisition the Aubrey and the crusades against the cathars and so on i think we're in that cycle again and i don't think you can actually reach these people i mean the climate change religion you couldn't have picked a more you couldn't have picked a better religion for secular people for atheists it's got all the classic elements of the the book of revelations all those elements are in there doom yeah. things, uh plenary indulgences to to, to to pay god off this kind of thing uh, and then they had that they've been primed by that and now this invisible force you know this god force of a virus you can't see who's omnipotent everywhere that you have these rituals and everything i think they're they're clever they've given back people who've lost ritual in the last like since the world war ii period where secularism has ruled they've given these people back ritual and they understand the power like you were saying the groups that you were involved in right? i've never been involved in that no, I'm not against that, but I do understand the power of ritual. I've been into enough Hindu temples. I've been to enough. I've even been to like Orthodox Catholic masses, and I understand. Jesus, this is incredible magic here. Going absolutely, on. yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was talking to Lon Mino the Ket last night, and even like the aesthetic of it, you know, the whole thing of Orthodox Catholicism. It, it's very difficult not, inside a beautiful cathedral not to be swept up by it. Well, they use the same things with with the secular people now. They they've replaced that beautiful aesthetic contained in the in in a hindu temple or in a buddhist temple or a, a, an orthodox catholic church and put it into small superficiality fake emotions instead and then that's become the kind of the internal sort of like pathological cathedral that all these secular types worship in and now they have their end of the world their, their, their doomsday has finally arrived they couldn't convince them completely with the climate change thing. It's almost like in the Bible, you know, John the Baptist, when they thought he was the, the son of God, he says, no, I'm the one preparing the way for the son of God. Yes. And like climate change prepared the way for what? Corona. Actually, it's interesting because one of my blog articles from last year is called It All Started With Climate Change. Because having observed that over 35 years or whatever it's been since I graduated, it, it was plain to me that a lot of the techniques were learned through how they did it with climate change. So the, um, the climate change denier, uh, you know, making somebody a pariah because they have an alternate point of view. Um, that's where that all came from. They, they tested the, the, the waters with different techniques in building that climate change narrative. And you see the same yeah. techniques being used now across the board. You have to admire them almost for their deviousness. It's like, you, you know, we, we grew up watching movies about like these kind of Doctor Who, Doctor No type characters and yeah. all these. What they gave us in the end was far more brilliant. They, con this, they did a Pavlovian conditioning of the entire planet. And they, oh, they used it all using virtue signaling and schmaltz and, and uh, platitudes and all this nonsense. And that's, that was, I mean, this the trust the science type the, the types that scream to you trust the science are the ones who are com almost certainly completely against actual science absolutely <laughs> I, I i um i had to laugh because somebody said to me trust the science and i said well i'm a scientist and i know how science is conducted and the last thing i you know you don't trust science you criticize science what <laughs> exactly I'll give you another one there. Someone, there was a, there was a, an art. They're, they're trying to push the, the, the needle crafts, the, the, yeah. the, 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 God knows the fourth or fifth injection, big time here in Ireland, whatever at the moment. And they have these people with no background in science using that thing. We must trust the science. Blah 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 blah. And then he says, there's a lot of ignorance out there of people who don't understand science. And what was interesting was the majority of comments on the YouTube video was, excuse me, very. Most of the people here do understand science, and that's why they're not taking this thing. They know it's not a vaccine. They, exactly. they're not gonna, they, 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 the irony is the ones that they're saying don't are ignorant of science or anti-science are the most scientific people in this whole 
yeah. drama. Yeah, exactly. Now, which brings me back to, does, in your opinion, a an interest in magic and magical tradition techniques, does it help build a, a critical, constructive thought process that immunizes us to this kind of narrative? Oh, absolutely. The, the, the consciousness firewall. Uh, yes, absolutely. A hundred percent, I think big time and that includes the things that go wrong with our magic as well because it refines our it refines our well i mean the art and science so it refines the science part of it to actually make sure we don't make the same mistakes again well absolutely i've no doubt about that i mean i other i don't know anyone who's involved in in, in magical workings other you know i'm not talking about wiccans here i'm talking about like people actually involved in this real stuff they are not that have fallen for this pray for this they immediately saw right through it just about everyone i know and now i have very few people have surprised me because they tended to be hippies who a lot of hippies who were like you know smash the state man they're all the they're the first ones being lined up now to get their injection yeah but otherwise i, I yeah absolutely 100 percent a consciousness firewall i heard something really worrying the other day that the oto in there uh, California are demanding face masks for rituals and things like this. So it's not a complete, it's not a complete thing, but um, yeah, I mean, definitely, absolutely. Because I mean, like I mean, the minute I saw the, the things like the, the, the Wuhan fuzzy videos of people in body bags and then the Milan trucks lined up in the dark and here in Ireland building field hospitals with a, with a, with a warship behind it. Well, what do you want a warship? I knew right away that this was coming to theater. I knew they were playing at those kind of about this is like backdrops, you know, it was like theater and uh, instantaneously. I knew, yeah, absolutely. It does. We've been, we have the, we have the faculties through our years of being involved in this to give us the conscious firewall. I definitely would agree with that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it was different though with the climate change. A lot of pagans I knew were kind of falling for the climate change thing because they think paganism is something to do with worship in nature exclusively, which you know, it doesn't. Yeah. But uh, yeah. there's a lot of that, no, a lot of that went on with them. But even them with wise stuff, some of them have wise stuff as well. Uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm glad to see so many people. Well, just about everyone I know who's involved in magic at some level see right through this, and hence we know who the witches they found in the past were. On on the on the climate stuff. I mean, if you're a, if you're a sort of leaning towards the the druid um, type scenario then plainly it's something that you can get sucked into but i often point out to those people that to some extent this is a smoke screen that's hiding a lot of the real environmental problems like um particulates and uh plastics and things like this and if you're a real environmentalist your concern ought to be elsewhere not with not with this climate narrative but with some of the real issues of uh, and and you know I'm, I'm in the commodities business so the talk about electric vehicles as being, you know, the clean future. Well, have you ever seen a lithium mine? Nope. It's a horrible. It's horrible. And uh, it, the clean future and the ethical future, and it's, it's even worse exploitation. At least yeah. in oil industry, some a, a fair amount of people. Have, look at the oil industry employs millions of people, and many of them are working class, you know, who work in the actual face yeah. of it. The lithium mines is just pure exploitation and slavery. It's like what yeah. we're living in. The the whole thing of the the earth, the druid thing, and the earth thing, we a lot of that is like Victorian nonsense. I know that, but a lot of these people are whipped up into the whole climate change thing. Who came from that kind of scene, definitely had a left wing spin to them. They were old crusties. They were all like lefties from the nineteen seventies. A lot of them were, and they still had this. They were still fighting Thatcher in their minds. In fact, I was quite surprised to see. Uh, Alan Moore go down that road as well. He's gone, you know, I know he's always been that from that world, but the, there, there's this element of people who are still fighting Thatcher and Reagan in their minds. And so therefore anything that they see as counter, counter corporation must be good. But if they looked at the electric car thing, they would just they would immediately know that that thing is just as destructive. I mean, all you have to do is go around Ireland and see all these bloody windmills that yeah. they put up in the scenery in Scotland and everywhere. And they've, at the same time, they've closed down loads of oil and gas stations, power stations. And now they're telling us we may be facing blackouts this winter of because we, can't, we don't have enough electricity capacity to keep all these data centers from Amazon and, uh, and going. I mean, 
it's it's uh, it's it, 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 well i mean you have to laugh at it otherwise you would crack up they don't they don't listen to the the experts um they just go with the political narrative and it, it's a you know i keep saying humanity is headed for some real major disasters because um common sense is now apparently right wing and critical thinking is right wing um you know we're the lunatic fringe for actually having brains and using them but uh when i look in my my line of work and look where we're going with things like evs and the grid we are headed to disaster i mean there is no not a single shred of doubt in my mind they talk about batteries but if you're going to have everybody driving around in an ev i, I just don't see how it's gonna it's gonna play out without dramatic shortages blackouts brownouts and in the UK, they're all anti-coal, you know, phasing out coal, blah, blah, blah. And what did what happened this week? They had to bring a coal fire, a, a power station back online because prices were £5,000 per whatever, because the renewables weren't functioning, you know, in, in this particular period of time where there was no wind and no sun. I mean, I could have told you that 20 years ago. I know, and even if you look at coal-fired stations today and oil-fired stations, have filtration systems in them that are incredible. That they're literally is only water comes out of the thing. You could they're, they're they're very close to to the green energy thing that you can get from a fossil fuel as possible. I often find it interesting. You find it interesting, Gary, when you talk about lithium. Lithium, everyone's obsessed with lithium, but lithium is also a drug used to cure mental illness. It's almost like I won't be mentally ill if I drive around in my lithium car. You know, it's almost like kind of an, an, a, as above, so below kind of thing going on. I, I, I've often laughed at that. Because about 20 years ago in Ireland, the town in County Clare, Ennis, like three large employers collapsed overnight, three factories, and like half the town was put out of work. And they had a crisis meeting in the town hall. And this GP stood forward and said, we can put lithium in the water supply so people don't riot. And I often, I often think in, you know, that was a solution to the unemployment problem, not, not like to help people, but like to, to drug them. And it was like, here we are here today. But I was thinking, like, I'm driving around in my lithium car because I'm insane and I need lithium all the time. <laughs> There's almost like a subconscious thing going on there. Yeah, well, that the cosmic I, joke is being played. I, I just seriously think, you know, that we're, we're headed for some big disasters and there are certain people that will wake up once the disasters hit. But it will take the disaster in order to wake them up, I think, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, but it, it's frightening how people, how many stories we're getting out now, people who've been given the needle and have had died or had horrific reactions. Mm. And either their families are going, it wasn't the needle. I know, you know this, denial. It, it's, I mean, it's cognitive dissonance on, on, on fecking steroids. It really is absolutely frightening. So it's going to take a while before we get to that broken bridge. But when it goes, I think it will, uh, you'll see mass suicides. In fact, I'm probably, I have a feeling there's already mass suicides. We don't hear about them and things like that, where people are, are actually, you know, you, you wouldn't hear about the paper would just say died suddenly. But you think like, oh, you, you got the needle and died. But I think there's a lot of mass suicides going on. There's people who cannot face, face their own existences at the moment. This whole, I mean, we live in a, I, I, the absurdity of this age, I can't get my head around at all. And I, I thought I'd be ready for just about anything. I mean, anything. I mean, if the, we live in a world where if, we, if alien spaceships landed tomorrow, it would be less absurd than what we're dealing with now. Exactly. I, I, I feel exactly the same. And sometimes I despair. And then I, I, I realize that the solution for me anyway, I don't know about you, but the solution, for, well, I think it's the same solution for you watching some of your videos. The solution for me is to, is to get into nature, get in the forest, be, uh, connect with the land and feel the earth energies and, and meditate and just forget the nonsense. And, uh, then I, then I'm repaired and ready for the next round. And, and be creative. I think it's a really important creative. Thing. Yes. You know, not necessarily being a you know in a band or or writing poetry do something like do your house up or you know keep yourself focused on very important i mean i think uh, if you keep yourself focused there's something about that minutia of being involved in a process that intensity that's very good for taking your mind away from the the the, the macro madness you know yeah. and i think so like i know i had people saying to me like what magic ritual could I do to escape the depression that this thing is causing me? 
and I say, well, build a model airplane, you know, go fishing. This is, this is your best thing right now. Do something like that. A friend of mine uh, told me, you know, contemplate the two tarot cards, the lovers and, and the devil. And, and I realized that I'd done that years ago and even written a book about it. And it was all there. It was, you know, the state of the world and, and the average person to me is like the devil card. And where you want to be is like the angel card in terms of conscious, subconscious communication with the higher self. And uh, on the devil card, there's none of that. And they feel like they're in prison, but actually the chains are loose. Yourself imprisoning yourself in the narrative. Yeah. So, you know, that uh, that helped me out a lot, just thinking through that. And so how do I get myself back into that lover's tarot card state? Well, I get my, yes, creativity. I'm very creative, um, do all kinds of stuff. But nature for me is where I find it. I just get out into the forest, find the goddess, and I'm fine. Which brings yeah, me to that's... paganism. <laughs> yeah, that's it's it's old fashioned, old fashioned. I mean, during the early eighteen hundreds, late seventeen hundreds, you had a group called the Ancients in South of England, who were kind of like Luddites who were against the industrial, who saw the industrialization of the English countryside and the carnage it was doing, and so they instead of like becoming Luddites and smashing machines, they were paint, people like the painter Samuel Palmer. What they used to do was they basically created a kind of a Christian mysticism where they went out into the and wandered in the countryside at night under the full moon and then painted what they saw, what they felt, their emotions. And you could see it was a tremendous healing force for them. If you look at Samuel Palmer's paintings, there's a beautiful serenity about them. It's absolutely gorgeous. And that was at the same time where you had like this situation where, you know, entire parts of the north of England and the Midlands were being churned up to build steel mills and, you know, ironworks and things like this. And you see, right, you see right there also with the Romantic movement in Germany was also facing the same thing. It was facing this kind of oblivion. And then you had the, the Volkish movements came from that. And they, they started out as very, quite nice things, very, very kind of harmless, passive things. Of course, they were weaponized later on by uh, like extremist um, nationalist factions but when they first started those focus movements they were just to get people out of the factory cities and communicating with the landscape just walking through the woods singing songs you know mm -hmm. and we've lost we don't even have that now you know with what we do fellas like us but i'm talking about like the average person they go they go deep into social media when they have a problem to want to escape that's invariably being caused by social media I suppose the creativity, it, the creativity aspect is about getting out of the mental body into the emotional body to some extent, is it? Mm, that's an interesting one. Or is it even about getting out? Uh, when you say emotional body, uh, it, are we really talking about the other, uh, the the daemon, the, the yeah. genius? Uh, the, this, yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. It is. It's no doubt about that. It was necessary as an emotional, well, though, though it could be, but yeah, I think, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the, the other, that's, I think when you talk about those people that were like, you know, voids in the suits, yeah. what they call the NPC today, the, and, the, and society is filled with them. People, there's nothing, there's no internal dialogue. There is no other inside them. I was talking to a Swami a few years back, and he was telling me that the reason why these people exist is because there's more bodies on the earth than there is souls to fill them. And with yeah. the population explosion of the last, you know, 100 years or so, we basically have these, these flesh robots. Yeah. And these flesh robots are used by pathological forces, his word. They're used by pathological forces to, to become like soulless automatons of the machine. Yeah. Eventually, they, they'll be destroyed and that, that, then they'll start over again. And I think that's a very fair summation of where we live and where we're going and how it's happening. Yeah, the, 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 the connection to the other. I mean, I can remember very distinctly as a child uh, uh, in 1974, there was a, 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 the UVF set a car bomb off around the corner from where I was in central Dublin and like 30 people were killed. I mean, and I wasn't near it or anything, but my ears popped and I heard the smell and the smell of burning rubber, the screams of people and were in the distance. But I can remember that was a moment where I kind of stepped into me. Like, I can't explain it. I can't even put it into words. But there was another part of me 
like I wasn't a little boy anymore who was 10. I was me and there was some other person in me. Right. And, and that was the other. That was when, and Jung talks about this, that a, a boy drowned. It's usually brought about with a conflict, often in the home and the family, but uh, sometimes exterior. And Jung talks about a, a boy had drowned in the river where he grew up in Switzerland. And he saw the body being removed. And he had that, that step in the consciousness too at the same point. Interesting. So, I mean, yeah, very interesting. And uh, I've, I've always been like, you know, wanting to kind of understand that, that trigger. Would that have happened organically later on? Probably would have. But are, are people like us, are we smashed into it at an early age? And that gives us like a head start over everyone else. Like, it does, I mean, I know people, I'm not going to remember to mention it because I'm related to them, but they really didn't have any sense in their heads until they hit their 40s. They were very... They were they were kind of, they were quite idiots. They weren't like voids, but they were very easily controlled by fashions and fads. Yeah. And then you know, and then so, and but there was there was a person in there, not a particularly interesting one, but a person, right? And then as soon as they hit forty, a new, a flowering and unfolding came from them, where a new kind of person arrived, uh, very wise and very mature, and. I've seen that happen to him. I know one guy, it didn't take him until he was in his 60s for that thing to happen, where he went from being a basically a bit of a douchebag all his life. And now he's a now what he's he's in his 70s, he's kind of become what Carl Jung called the Senex, the, the individuated male, elder yeah. male. You know, so it's like, you know, it happened in one rush at the very end. So there's those kinds of people too. So let's not assume that everyone who's a bit superficial is dead inside. They're probably just developing later. But what you were saying about the devil card, and they're not, and that's the thing. They're not chained to that plinth that the devil is standing on. And the only thing that gives superiority of the devil over those people is that he's standing on a piece of concrete over them. Otherwise, he's not a superior. I think, it, I think people eventually that do have an internal dialogue will eventually, and this is what you were talking about, they will eventually look around and say, that chains are not, those chains are not connected to that, that the devil. Yeah. I think, so there, if it is hope for the future, it's them folks. Yeah. So just to finish off, you've uh, posted a few videos like um, paganism is coming back and, and this kind of thing. And I just wanted to drill into that for the last few minutes. Um, why is paganism so important to you? And, and, you know, how do you, what do you mean by paganism in that context, I guess? Because I, I would say sometimes I'm not sure if you're talking about organized religion or against Christianity. Well, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of both, really. Well, paganism is, you know, to use the, the, the basic term, it's religions that are not the, the Abrahamic religions, yep. Judaism, Islam, Christianity. Now, there's also monotheistic pagan religions, such as Mithraism, Zaroastrianism, yep. and there's also uh, the last re pagan religion of Ireland, the Krom Kruik cult, was a, was a monotheistic religion as well, uh, more or less. To me, paganism, well, if, if you look at, I've also got a, a, a tremendous interest, interest in Hinduism and the Vedic stuff as well, which is almost identical. It's very, it's, 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 it definitely comes from the same branch. To me, paganism represents three fundamental core things. The first one is the, well, not, not in any order, but like one is the cycles of universe. Everything is secular. And that includes human dynamics, human consciousness, and includes you as a person. You come back, just like life comes back into the trees every spring. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's a central part of it. It's not necessarily polytheistic, though a lot of people think it is, and it's the worship of nature. It's not necessarily that either. That tends to be a more modern thing that came out of, like, Victorian romanticism. They, these kind of, like, neo-pagan neo or neo-Druidic groups that showed up. It can be, but not necessarily. Uh, the other one is magic. I mean, this is why there was such an enormous prohibition on magic within Abrahamic religions, because pagans knew you could alter the fabric of reality through the true application of consciousness and get intention and the will. And they discovered this. And this was no good if you have a priest class that that is against this. I mean, the ritualism of the Catholic Church is basically the stolen magic of all the pagan traditions that it robbed from, it's stolen yeah. from. Otherwise, it would just be a second temple rabbinical cult 
that came out of the Syrian desert about, you know, and smashed up the Temple of Palmyra. Apart from that, it was when it moved into the Roman Empire and the same kind of people that are giving us climate change and lockdowns now discovered this religion could be very useful in the yes. army. <laughs> they, think, they think they're going to go to heaven. And that's how the Roman Empire became Christian and how Europe, the West became Christianized. But uh, uh, to me, the, re- uh, the honest reason that I, I personally was drawn to paganism is because I grew up in a country torn apart by religion. And, you know, and every night on the news, there's people killing each other over being Catholics or Protestants. And yet I still felt this very deep spiritual need inside me. And it was basically that. Yeah, and then I, I understand that. Understand that there was other, you know, you 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 brought up to believe that your religion is the default and there's nothing else. Oh yeah, there's other religions, of course, but they're not the right one, or they're not, you know, they're all wrong. And suddenly, I find this religion. And I think the beauty of paganism is more than anything else, is there is no books, there is no book, and that's where its power lies. And that's why even in say radical Islam in jihad. They have this belief that you you must respect all people of the books because they're aware that if there's a book of rules, they will follow it. Uh, they will have to follow it. And pagans don't have a book of rules. And this is the great power of paganism and why, you know, it, it, it survives even into the technological age. You will, you will have, you know, quantum gods for quantum futures. I mean, if any religion, you know, I, I hear them all talking about Christ consciousness and how the quantum world is validated the bible i went to the necronomicon in uh, in providence again in rhode island a few years two years ago and they had this guy he was a, he was a really a really cool guy and i got talking to him later but he was, he was like a young rabbi and he was talking about how the quantum field is the quantum science has made the bible and the torah and all this real and it was like dude you know the pagans know this they don't have to find a way to validate it they know this stuff and he was a very nice fella. He la- we had a good laugh about it later on. But uh, he said, yeah, yeah, you're right. And all this kind of, he, didn't, he wasn't like a bigot or anything like that. But uh, the, I was trying to explain that the nature of good and evil is very different when you're a pagan than when you're a, a mono, an Abrahamic. And I, I, I was, there was a debate about the, 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 the Lovecraftian mythos. And I, and I, I silenced a, th- a theater full of people when I said every single... I was in the audience and they had a question in the audience. I said, every single debate we've had about Lovecraft's writing has revolved around good and evil from a, an Abrahamic point of view, i.e. the Ten Commandments, yeah. whatever. I said, if you step outside that and you look at the, the, the Lovecraftian mythos from the point of a pagan or a Hindu, you don't have that same good and bad, right and wrong. Uh, you have ob- objectivity and subjectivity. And that's why all the protagonists in his books are never killed by the monsters themselves. They either go mad or they commit suicide. It's because they haven't figured out that their reaction to it is the difference of it, the strangeness of it, where in a pagan consciousness, because of things like animism, you understand that everything has a life and a soul and a consciousness, even the sun. Mm-hmm. And it, when a star explodes and destroys planets, it's not evil. It's just nature. It's yep. just nature. When you see a snake, you know, it's, it's horrific to see a snake killing an animal. Uh, say, say like killing a rabbit or something. And you're shocked by it. But it's, na- it's not, the snake is not evil. The lion is not evil. The shark is not evil. Uh, when you have the mon- monotheistic view that it's good and bad because one is evil and one is, isn't, you create a very polarized world, which is where it's brought us to where we are, are now with the whole needlecraft and the lockdowns and the climate change you are evil or you're not. I always say I don't believe in morality. I think morality is a pile of bullshit because that's all based subjectively on religion. The Ten Commandments again. I'm into human decency. And, you know, this is why you you have Bible Belt Christians making the most incredible statements like, if we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't know right from wrong. And that to me, that them saying that sums up perfectly why I'm a pagan. Yeah. Indeed. Well, let's wrap it up there because we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground. I uh, just invite you to um, mention how people can find out more about you and visit some of your videos or work if you want. My main outlet these days is uh, my, my books. You can get them all on bookdepositoryco.uk or Amazon, all those places. It's Thomas Sheridan. Just type my name into the book sites and they're there if you want to get a book. 
my book on magic, my two books relevant to this site would to this talk would be sorcery the invocation of strangeness and the druid code they're very similar kind of books mm -hmm. uh, they paganism and magic and stuff like that uh, in terms of my main work nowadays is on youtube on videos i have a channel called beyond the room 313 and we're interviewing interesting people again we're trying to make a dialogue and get our way out of this stuff i might have i should have you on it by the way and gary and uh, also we have uh, we make documentaries on different subjects paranormal and fortune remember fortune and paranormal is also part of magic people yeah. forget that yeah. people forget that often uh paranormal investigators are default magicians just like sci-fi writers are yeah and people forget that and that's also part of the magical thing you know like i don't believe in magic but i, I go ghost hunting yeah you, you believe in magic <laughs> and uh, but so uh so that's that's basically it so and uh I, I'm always I'm 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 always up for having a laugh and a, bit, a lot of fun and I have a Facebook page. It's mostly me telling jokes and sharing memes and having a laugh. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's basically it. Uh, my attitude is that uh, we're not going. We can't depend on the actual patrol system now to actually help us out. And it's for us as individuals and tribes to come together and create a parallel society that exists. Not when I that, by that I, mean, I don't mean like a off in the woods of guns, I mean, in this society, but we yeah. have to develop a conscious firewall to actually keep us safe as possible and sane as possible away from these mad bastards who run the world. <laughs> Agreed. Well, I don't know about you, but I really sincerely enjoyed talking to Thomas today. It was absolutely informative and a lot of fun. And uh, I do encourage you to seek out his books and to seek out his YouTube channels I'll leave information in the notes below so that you can find them more easily. Well, this is G. Michael Vesey with the Magical World of G. Michael Vesey podcast series. And coming up, I've got uh, some really interesting guests, uh, including Phoenix, a Slavic shaman who lives in central US, and Stuart Franz, who is one of the uh, directors of the Silent Eye School. So with that, I'll say goodbye for now. Thank you for listening. Do please like and share and tell people about this podcast if you think they'd be interested. And once again, thank you to Thomas Sheridan for taking part. Thank you to you for listening. Have a great day. Till the next time. Bye-bye.